statistic, though, looking at the fact that the stats have increased by 73 percent since uh, 2013. Perhaps let me start, start with you. What could be the reasons behind the sharp incline? Well, firstly, Tommy, thank you for the opportunity. We think it's um, related to the sophistication of vehicles. Um, they're becoming much, much more difficult to steal. Um, and there is a demand for high-end SUV vehicles and the one-ton LDVs. Um, and so the hijacking has increased as a result of that. Furthermore, uh, it's just opportune to be able to hijack people. It's easier rather than stealing. And, and then, of course, there's also the hijacking of um, business vehicles for the fast-moving consumer goods. The hostage-taking is an alarming statistic. Uh, we really are concerned about the impact it has on the public out there and our customers. Um, clearly, nearly 30% of hostages being taken per activation uh, is really not uh, a good thing for our public out there. Mm. You made a differentiation between hijacking and cars being stolen. Uh, won't you just elaborate on that? So a vehicle that is stolen is stolen um, without keys um, in, in our parlance. Um, the vehicle gets taken while it is parked off. Um, generally, there is no one in the vehicle. And so they break into the vehicle, they um, start the vehicle, and they drive off. Um, where a vehicle is hijacked, um, that's defined as robbery. And that is where a person is in the vehicle normally, and they are deprived of the vehicle through force, either with a firearm, a knife, or something of that nature. Uh, and obviously, the trauma associated with that is... is greatly enhanced because of um, the impact of the, the firearm or the, or the weapon. Mm. Now, Rhino, part of what came out of this um, entire report is that people often think that car hijackings are a random act, mm. but in fact, they're not. It, it's through, I was in the fortunate position to um, interview two ex-hijackers, and it's part of the organized crime when it comes to hijacking. So they get a, a list on a weekend. Um, they do their shopping on usually on the weekends and on Mondays, and that's when they hit. So you'll see the prone times are usually on a on a Tuesday or on a Friday because they also look where what the movements are of the individuals, the specific car they're looking for, and if they don't find that car at a specific time and date, um, they usually go for a vehicle of a similar make model but not necessarily the colour, just so that they can get to those kind of vehicles to the organized crime bosses. Are you then saying to me that hijackings happen only after a specific order for a specific make of car has been made? So it's not a random selection of cars? They are random when the crime has been committed and the suspect's trying to get away, then they will hijack a vehicle and, get, and obviously drop it once they've um, vacated the area. But it's mostly organized crime is hijackings for specific make models. So Tuesdays, one would see a spike Correct. in car hijackings, Fridays as well as people near the weekend. And as far as the specific time of day? You can look. Well, from our statistics, um, it's from 11 to 1 on a Friday for hijacking, and then from 8 o'clock in the evening until 11 o'clock in the evening. Yep. And, and the situation with hostages, I mean, that has also seen an increase. Why would you say... And how are the hostages often treated in, in situations when they have been hijacked? I think it's more got to do with um, the, the panic buttons that goes with it, somebody that's going missing. It's more difficult to report the incident because there's panic buttons in some of the vehicles. You push a panic button and it goes out. So by taking the, in the individual or the victim hostage, it takes longer. Then there's also they've got their bank cards with them, take them to the ATMs, draw cash, and during after the hijacking. And you also mentioned in this report the fact that it's often quite difficult to get the kingpin um, of, of the syndicate. That it's usually, you know, the other criminals that, that are being sent out. Talk to us about this dynamic. Yes, there are various levels in, in a syndicate. And it is normally the lower levels that perform the crime um, and the, the upper levels that receive the, the major benefit. That is a fact. So we work very closely with the SAPS and support them to, to try and piece together um, all the information and the evidence, the chain of evidence that can point towards the syndicate leaders, the people that are higher up in the hierarchy, in order to put them behind bars. It is a, a detailed process and a tedious process. It takes time. Um, and I must say that the SAPS are very cooperative and, and assist us uh, with the information that we provide them. 
and, and they do have successes in putting these uh, syndicate leaders um, away. Mm. And, and what type of, of patterns are there that you found as far as the criminals are concerned? I, I know we've read um, quite regularly in the news of criminals impersonating law uh, traffic enforcers, for example. Talk to us about the dynamics of, of that. Yes, that is one of the trends at the moment, um, the blue light robberies as we, as we call them. And it also happens in specific areas. Um, the Delmas area, the N3, we've noticed quite an increase um, of those kind of activities there. Uh, and it's just, you know, desperation from, from the criminals. They will use any means at their disposal to, to try and achieve their aim, which is to dispossess the, the driver of the vehicle. And, and most people will stop if they are um, asked to buy a vehicle with blue lights, assuming it's a police vehicle, probably an unmarked one. So how does then the unsuspecting you know, road user, driver, react in a situation where they are being stopped and they're not sure whether or not this could be part of a crime syndicate? I think the best um, will be to <coughs> notify your security company if you're close to your home. Usually the hijackings occur close to your home or at the shopping centre. Drive to your nearest police station or go to a well-lit area petrol station and indicate to the police officers. They won't necessarily just start shooting at you, so you can indicate to them that you would like them to follow you and go into a wallet area or go to the police station. And they need to certify themselves when they get out of the vehicle and not just in plain clothes stipulate they are police officers. So it, in this day and age, it happens more and more, especially on the highway. So preferably go to the nearest uh, petrol station. So, so what do you do? Because practically you're on the road, you're driving. Uh, uh, somebody who looks like a police officer wants to pull you over. You're not sure, you're suspecting that maybe you're going to be hijacked. What do you do at that particular time? Because also you don't want to you know, uh, get the ire of the, the law enforcement agent if there are a law enforcement agent, and then you find yourself in, in more trouble. What does one do at that particular moment as a driver? If I can just add to what Rania said, um, I would suggest that you put your, ha your hazards on. You don't speed up. You continue driving at the normal speed. You try and indicate to them to follow you and you drive towards the nearest police station. And, and in that, that, that's really all that you can do. If you are able to, with a hands-free kit, to contact um, someone, then I would, I would do that. If you do have an assist button, as Rhino alluded to just now, um, I would suggest that you press that, mm. so that everyone that can possibly make, be made aware of your circumstances are made aware of it. I mean, obviously, a lot of cars are fitted with a tracker nowadays, but do these syndicates know how to disarm the tracker? Unfortunately, they do. The, the, the criminals are professionals, Tommy. They, they really know what they're doing. They know that there are limited places or locations in the vehicle where you can hide a tracking device. Um, and so they are, to a certain extent, successful uh, in being able to compromise a device. Um, that is why it is so important that you take other measures to, to try and protect yourself and your loved ones. Things like share your journey let people know when you're leaving the office. Share your journey with them so that they can follow you on a, a phone app, for example. So that if you are parked off and your vehicle should not be there, they can, be, they can alert the, the authorities or your tracking company to establish the safety of you and your vehicle. Mm. And, and what kind of advice would you give? I think the most prone one that I can indicate is to remain vigilant, stay off your phone. With the social media and everybody scaring or scared of losing a SMS or WhatsApp or email and Facebook, when they stop at a robot, the first thing they do is they pick up the phone and they look at that. But you need to remain vigilant at all times, especially when you're close to home approaching a robot. Um, and as Ron indicates it as well, let your plan ahead on your, tri on your trip. Indicate to your loved ones or the office, whoever, what time you will be expected. And if you don't reach that point, they need to make a phone call. But also, you can um, program your phone these days with the smartphones that only loved ones can get hold of you direct. So put it on silence and only emergency calls can come through. So if there is an emergency, it will come through. Your life is not worth your phone. Are there things that we do as drivers that make us easy targets? Yes, there are. If I can add to what, what Ryan has said, is when you're not vigilant, if you are complacent, if you leave um, valuables in the vehicle, and you're driving with the valuables in the vehicle, um, that, that makes you, you vulnerable. If you leave a shopping center with bags from expensive stores, um, the criminal, criminals are on the lookout for that, and they will follow you mm. because they know that you might have bought 
a Rolex watch, for example, or a Cartier or something of that nature. And those are the kind of goods that they're really looking for. And they will follow you and they will hijack you for, for those goods. Mm. So you need to be aware and, and try not to, to show off those kind of bags, etc. Disguise them if you can in a way. In, put them into another bag and, and drop your stuff in the boot and then drive off um, mm. home. Now, based on the, on the re investigations that were done as the report was being compiled, when they eventually target you and you become a victim of a hijacking, is it because they've been tracking you and following you for a long period of time? There's, it's, too, it's either or. So, as I said earlier, they either, either track you or see what your daily routine is, and then they will hit, or it is a crime has been committed and then they need to get away. So that's when they will hijack you. So it could still help you to change your route and, and not Correct. be too predictable. Gentlemen, I thank you so much um, for your time uh, this evening. Uh, very worthwhile statistics and it's great for us all just to be vigilant. So n none of us wants to end up being a victim of crime. Thank you, sirs. Thank you, Tommy. So uh, that is uh, Mr. Ron Not Craig from Tracker South Africa, as well as Mr. Rhino Skitter from Proactive South Africa, focusing there on uh, the crime statistics. Now, after the break, we'll discuss women in the ICT industry, and we'll be talking to Zine Nkugwana, who is the CEO of Women in ICT. Do stay with us. <laughs>